Hi! In this video, we are going to look at flux of a vector field F through a surface S. So remember, we've already looked at flux of a vector field F through a curve, so we are now just extending that to flux of a vector field through a surface. Alright, so we need a continuous vector field over S. S is supposed to be an orientable surface, so we'll talk about that in a minute, with a unit normal vector N, the flux of F through S in the direction of N is given by this surface integral. And if you remember before, when we did flux of F through a curve, we had a line integral and we had F dot N dS and that N was a unit normal vector to the curve, generally outward if our curve was closed or if we didn't have a closed curve, we chose a direction for that out for that unit normal vector n. Alright, so the same idea here, notice that it's almost exactly the same integral, it's just that instead of integrating along a curve with an arc length differential, you're going to be integrating over a surface with a surface area differential. Alright, so the idea of what we're measuring here is basically the same, we're measuring how much f is lined up with those n vectors, those dot products of f and n being positive or negative depending on how the angle between our vector field vectors f and our n vectors on the curve are. Alright, so uh, let's look a little bit at this phrase here, orientable surface. So we're going to look at some pictures of some surfaces and talk about what it means to be an orientable surface. Alright, so I've just got some pictures here of some different surfaces that I graphed in Calcplot 3D and three of these surfaces are orientable surfaces and one of them is not. So let's start with the ellipsoid. The idea with an orientable surface is that I need to be able to define a, an outer unit normal vector n. So I've got a vector n and as I move all along this surface my vector n pointing outward, it's not going to do anything uh, sort of unstable. Right? As I move all around this surface, as I let my x's and y's vary, my n vector is going to be pointing outward from the surface. There's a clear outward to this surface here. Um, Alright, and then for my other surfaces, there's not a clear outward or inward. I do have a paraboloid and so we might think about if that were like a bowl, the outside of the bowl or the inside of the bowl, but there's not really a clear outside and inside just of the surface like that. But I can, on the paraboloid, define a unit normal vector to be pointing generally downward, in a downward outside part of the surface here, or upward on the inside part of the surface. So I can define a unit normal and all throughout that surface it's clear what is meant by that unit normal. Um, next to that I've got a picture of a plane, just a portion of the plane really here, and the same thing on that, there's no inside or outside of a plane, but it's easy to think about a unit normal vector that would be pointing generally upward on this plane and normal to the plane everywhere, or downward and normal to the plane pointing the opposite direction. Alright, so all three of those are orientable surfaces. The one that we haven't talked about yet is actually a non-orientable surface. We looked at this when we looked at parameterized surfaces in Calcplot 3D. This is a Merbius strip and it's kind of a famous surface and there's all kinds of interesting things you can look at with that, but one of the things that we want to talk about right now is that this is an example of a non-orientable surface. And this is just a static picture from Calcplot 3D, I just took screenshots so I can't rotate this around, but if you want you can go in there and look and rotate that around. Alright, but I especially like this picture with the grid lines on it, and if I define a normal vector to be perpendicular to my surface and pointing that way, and then I travel along these grid lines, you can see these circles, and so by the time I get over here, it would be pointing inward. If I keep following those circles around, here notice that I'm on the inside of the surface, and if I keep following those circle, circles around, I'll still be on the inside of the surface, and when I get back around to over here, 
my unit normal vector will now have changed to the other side of the surface. It's got a twist in the surface. On a surface like that, you cannot define a stable normal vector that as you move around the surface, it's clearly pointing one direction or the other on the surface. And so this idea that as you come all around here, it will have changed sides of the surface. All right, so this is a non-orientable surface. Most of the ones, I think all of the ones in your homework are orientable surfaces, so you can define a unit normal vector to that, either outward or inward or upward or downward, that you can clearly define that vector. Okay, so we understand what a, an orientable surface is, that you can define a unit normal vector. And then we just need to think about how we might set up that integral. So remember when we did the line integrals for our unit normal vector, we used plus or minus t cross k. And depending on the orientation of the curve, the t cross k was maybe pointing in the right direction or not. And so we chose the plus or minus to establish the correct direction for that. For flux integrals, we won't be using t cross k. There would really be infinitely many tangent vectors to a surface at a point. So we need to think of some other way to get a normal vector to a surface. So this goes back to something that we did a couple chapters ago. We know that if we have an expression like this, where I've got the surface given by a function of three variables equals constant, we can think about that as a level surface of that function of three variables, of that g of x, y, z. And we know that a gradient vector will be perpendicular to that level surface, but it might not be a unit vector. So I can divide by its magnitude and get a unit vector, but it might not be pointing the correct direction, so we've got to choose the plus or the minus to ensure that that's pointing in the correct direction to get our unit normal vector. Um, if our surface is given by a parameterization, we can use n equals plus or minus the cross product of these partial derivative vectors that we used before when we defined that surface area differential. And we can use that for the unit normal vector. All right, so we've got an example down here. We need to decide whether I want to do this as just an ordinary x, y, z equation or if I want to parameterize the surface. So my strategy generally is just to try it with the XYZ equations, especially if that's what you're given. If it's starting to get kind of ugly, and especially if you have a lot of nice symmetry where perhaps um, polar coordinates or spherical coordinates might be helpful, then you might think about writing a parameterization. But let's go ahead and try this one with just XYZ and see what happens. Okay, so we have a vector field that is made up of polynomial functions. So that vector field F is continuous everywhere. So that was one of the conditions that we needed. Our surface S is a portion of a paraboloid. So I'm going to draw a little sketch of that graph. This would just be basic paraboloid that opens up, circular cross sections, vertex at the origin. The portion of the paraboloid that lies below the plane z equals 1, so just up here to a height of z equals 1, and n is oriented outward from the paraboloid, all right? So I need to think about my unit normal vector n will be pointing outward from the paraboloid. So I'm just going to draw a couple of them here. All right, so flux, you should not have a hard time remembering this flux equation. This is connected to what we did with flux across curves. So flux across a surface is just going to be a surface integral of f dot n, and then the appropriate differential for a surface integral would be that d sigma. All right, so I have my f. I need to think about my unit normal vector n. So I'll remember, in order to think about that unit normal vector n for a surface, I talked about using the gradient vector. So the key there, though, is that I need to make sure that my g is a level surface of a function of three variables. So my equation for my surface here is given as z equals a function of x and y. I need to write that in an implicit form 
So I need all of my x's, y's, and z's on one side and equal to a constant. So I have a choice about how I do that. I can either choose to subtract z from both sides or subtract x squared and y squared from both sides. So I'm going to write this as 0 equals x squared plus y squared minus z. So this is my function g. So my gradient vector will just be the partial derivative with respect to x, 2x, partial derivative with respect to y, 2y, and partial derivative with respect to z, minus 1. Okay, so I've now calculated my gradient vector. I will need to find the magnitude of that gradient vector, and I also need to choose the direction, plus or minus. It doesn't really matter which order I do those things in. I'm going to go ahead and choose the direction first. Okay, so here's how I think about this. I use the picture, and I look at my gradient vector, and I just think about, is that pointing in the correct direction? And I focus sometimes on whatever is the easiest component to think about. So for this one, that's the k component of this gradient vector. The k component of that gradient vector is negative, which means that these gradient vectors will all be pointing down. So all of these gradient vectors, no matter what x's and y's are, are going to be pointing generally down. And so when I look up here at my picture, and I see that all of these vectors that I drew here as outer unit normals have a downward component, so a negative k component. So this one is in the correct direction, so I'm going to choose plus. Notice that if I had chosen my algebra a little differently, if I had chosen to subtract x squared and y squared instead of subtracting z from both sides, then I would have opposite signs in my gradient vector and I would need to choose negative to turn that around. All right, and then I need magnitude of my gradient vector. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and set up some parts of my surface integral here, and then we'll set up the rest of it. So a surface integral is going to eventually turn into a double integral. So I need to remember to do that, but I'm going to go ahead here and write my f dot n. So my n was my gradient vector divided by its magnitude, and then my differential d sigma. Okay, so I'm going to at some point need to go ahead and do that dot product, so we'll do that in a little bit. Uh, I also need to set up a surface integral, so I need to think about how I want to do that. I can look at my surface and think about whether I have a one-to-one -one projection of that surface into any of the coordinate planes. If I don't, then I might want to think about parameterizing the surface and doing the problem that way. But this one does, it has a nice one-to-one -one projection down into the xy plane. So if I look at the shadow of my surface down into the xy plane, that's where I get that nice one-to-one -one projection. And remember that my paraboloid went up to a height of z equals 1, and when z equals 1 on the equation of my paraboloid, I have the circle of radius 1, so that projection would be a circle of radius 1. So I would choose to set this surface integral up as an xy integral over my region xy in the xy plane. With the circle of radius 1 and the x squared plus y squared in my integral, I might want to convert to polar coordinates at some point, but I'm going to wait to do that until I've got the integral set up here. Okay, so we're going to project into the xy plane, and then remember for your d sigma that if you're using an explicit function form, which is what we have when we have z equals x squared plus y squared, that that d sigma is going to be square root of del z del x, the quantity squared, plus del z del y, the quantity squared, plus 1 and dA. And again, those del z del x's and del z del y's came from the equation of my surface. All right, so the other thing that would be important is if I had any z's anywhere in my vector field equation or my unit normal vector, I would need to make sure that I substitute in the equation of my paraboloid for z since I'm going to be integrating in the xy plane with respect to x and y. So when I look at this big old mess that I have here, I might notice that there are no z's, so I don't have to worry about that here. The other thing I'm going to notice about this big old mess here is that thankfully these two radicals cancel. So if you think about where those two radicals came from, they both came from the equation of the surface, 
and one of them was the magnitude of the gradient vector that was my denominator and the other was from the d sigma surface area differential that we talked about in some prior videos so those both came from the equation of the surface they will not always cancel exactly sometimes there will be something left when they cancel but you should often expect some nice cancellation from that because of where those values actually just came from all right um, in this case though they cancel completely so I can go ahead and do my dot product all right so you might pause and think about whether you can write down the answer for this you probably cannot completely write down the answer but you can simplify it a little bit all right so here I have split my integral up into two pieces and you don't have to do this but recognizing that you can do this will save you a little bit of time here so I've split off the part that involves the X's and Y's, which I will need to integrate, and this part back here that's just a constant function. So this part back here represents 2 times the area of my RXY. And remember that RXY is just a circle of radius 1, so that part is 2 times pi times 1 squared, or just 2 pi. Okay, for the other part here, I can set up a double integral and I'll probably switch to polar coordinates. It's pretty straightforward in polar coordinates. All right, so here I have finished all my integration. I converted the first part here to polar coordinates. So in place of x squared plus y squared, I put r squared. And then don't forget the dA in polar coordinates is r dr d theta. So be careful about that. You want to simplify that before you do that integration. And then from there on out, it's pretty straightforward. My 2 pi at the back end here was from the 2 times the area of that region. So I just carried that through so that I didn't forget it to be there. And so I end up with 2 pi. So I have a positive flux, which means I have more flow in the direction of those n vectors, which are outward on that paraboloid than I do inward. It doesn't mean that all the flow is outward, but it means I have more flow out than in across that surface. So it might be interesting to look at a picture of that vector field and that surface and see if you can verify that from looking at the picture. 